Dobrý večer, vážené dámy, vážení páni. Vítajte na... Viem, či som teda správny. Vítajte na druhej prednáške v poradí, druhej prednáške z nás od cyklu Revisited. Dovolte mi, aby som privítal v prvom rade nášho vzácného hostia, profesora Beata Vísa z Univerzity z Karlsruhe, ktorý prijal naše pozvanie. A rovnako by som rád privítal medzi nami neskorších účastníkov okrúleho stola, Aleksandru Kusu, generálnu riaditeľku Slovenskej národnej galerie a Marka Pokorného, riaditeľa Domu umenia v Ostrave. Platformy. Profesor Vís sa narodil v roku 1947 v Bazileji. Je členom vedenia Univerzity umenia a dizajnu v Karlsruhe pre oblasť dejin umenia a mediálnej teórie. Zaoberá sa teóriou obrazu a kultúrnymi štúdiami. Bol poverený vybudovaním doktorantskej školy na Švajčiarskom inštitúte pre výskum umenia v Cúrichu, kde inicioval výskumný program o histórii Benátskeho Bienále. V súčasnosti v rámci tohoto programu vedie viacerých doktorandov. Pôsobil ako hostujúci profesor medzi inými na Cornell University, Aarhus University v Dánsku, v Estonsku, New Europe College v Bukurešti. Stal sa víťazom Lucenskej výtvarnej ceny, je členom Akadémie vied v Heidelbergu, členom švajčarskej sekcie AIKA a získal štipendia v Getty Center, v IFK vo Viedni, Instituto Svícero di Roma a v Clark Art Institute vo Williamstown, kde som mal tú možnosť sa s ním v Lani v februári stretnúť. Jeho kniha Hegelové dejiny umenia a kritika moderny bola preložená aj do angličtiny. Z posledných projektov treba spomenúť svetovú knihu o svetovej výstave v Paríži v roku 1889, ktorá tiež do istej miery rámcuje to, o čom dnes budeme sa tu rozprávať. Takže ešte raz vás tu všetkých vítam a odozdávam slovo profesorovi Vysovi. Ďakujem. Thank you, Richard, for your nice introduction. I don't know which you, what you said. I, l I learned once Czech, uh, but I think I'm afraid I forgot everything. Um, that was a time when I was, uh, I had a girlfriend. It was, was just af after, um, after the, the Soviet invasion, ni uh, 1969, and uh, we were, together a couple of years and then when we split up I lost the language again so um, sorry for uh, speaking English um, I'll talk about um, tonight about globalization of periphery uh, it is in the frame uh, it, the, 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 the text is uh, emerging in in the in a framework of um, large um, research project on the history of the Venice Biennial. I will first a little bit in, in, in introduce you in this uh, field study. Uh, it's a doctoral project. Then I will go back uh, to uh, lab laboratories of uh, globalization to um, uh, world fairs of 19th century, you see, I will go, uh, I, I mean, I know, I'm so aware that uh, going back uh, beyond um, Second World War, uh, today, in, in our days, art histor uh, historiography, it is already uh, considered to be archaeology, but I think it is very I uh, important to have this understanding of uh, long durée of uh, a long dur um, duration of uh, globalization. And, um, um, then I will make a little uh, um, digression um, uh, on met um, historiographical methodics, uh, st talking about hegemonial and uh, cultural identities. Then um, I will explain my notion of global peripheries and make a critical remark on the Cartesian curator. Historiography of art since 1900 fosters the retrospective octorial ideology of the avant-garde by conceiving its subject 
as a progressing international movement against a backdrop of local diehards. The formative years of art historiography historiography in the spirit of Hegelianism and vitalism induced to the discipline this biologistic notion of an organic development in art. According to the paradigm, art geography consists in a field. Ideas in art become disseminated by sowers who cultivate their acre. They come from metropolitan centers in order to fertilize peripheries, which eagerly strive to conceive the measured trends of a given time. The project I will present now intends to quit this evolutionist colonial notion of art history. The research launched um, in 2008 by the Swiss Institute of Art Research in Zurich, literally puts the horse before the chart. The aim is to gain a plural notion of modernities. We intend to explore the way how different regions and nations act and react culturally within the effects caused by industrialization, colonization, nation building, and the emergence of global markets. For this scope, the Venice Biennial delivers a coherent field of case studies. The research focus on Venice as a specific curatorial place enables to gain a kaleidoscopic, simultaneous view on art since 1900. It has been highly disputed, the art since 1900 from, uh, by the October group, uh, uh, then when it get transla got translated in Eastern European languages, at, which, which has been really considered as a colonial act, which is, was all so in a certain sense. The exhibiting sites of the Forma Serenissima represent a world en miniature, a political map of alliances, animosities, and idiosyncrasies among states which underwent dramatic developments during the last 119 years. Symbolically steeped in history, the Giardini of Venice had been installed by Napoleon, the emperor in the spirit of French Revolution, who hammered by war policy the corset of Europe towards its modern shape. The first campaign was dedicated to East Central Europe, a battleground of political system from the times of both the German and the Habsburg empires of fascism, socialism, up to the two days post-communist era. The research campaign happened in cooperation with an international initiative supported by the Clark Institute and uh, the Getty Center about art historiography in East Central Europe, where I was uh, appointed as in the peer group. With me was uh, for, for uh, Slovakia, Maria Oriškova also in, in this group. I show you here um, uh, the, the, the ongoing projects, and most of them, uh, one of them is already finished, of Annika Hossain, uh, on the, uh, the, pavilion, uh, the history of the pavilion of USA. Every other, uh, King Abodi from Ungar, uh, Hungary, uh, Daria Giu from Romania, uh, they, they will finish uh, just this summer, uh, their PhD, and Still in process are uh, Karolina Jevtic, uh, uh, so, uh, about uh, Yugoslavia, Serbia, the, 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 the contributions. Um, it's all the time, it starts with the beginning. Of, it is also the whole range of history of modern art is included. And one, we have also one loss, Veronika Wolf, for um, 
Czechoslovakia. Some of uh, you know her probably. Actually, she is a director of the Lop Lopkowitz collection. Also, Lopkowitz just um, just take uh, took her away <laughs> from from uh, this project, and it is still uh, desiderate because um, um, Veronica she had uh, committed her master thesis on um, the Czechoslovak con um, co contribution uh, to the Venice Biennial until 19 the 1980s. And uh, it would be a very nice project just to complete it and also to, to adjust it uh, to our time. That, that probably we can um, find a solution for that. Now, having um, uh, moved back uh, from um, uh, the Zurich Institute uh, to Karlsruhe, I could appoint two further PhD students who opened up a global perspective of uh, the project. This um, um, Rui Zhang uh, fr uh, fr from uh, Heidel uh, a Sinologist uh, from Heidelberg University who takes care of the Chinese um, uh, contribution, which started relatively late. In 1956 was uh, the first official contribution by uh, Kibaishi. Kibaishi actually is one hot, uh, hot shot in the auction business. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, he won one ink painting achieved uh, about eight 86 million dollars. You know, um, he, he became now, in the eyes of Chinese collectors, he is for them the equivalent to Picasso. He, was, uh, the, he, he met also Picasso in 1956 in, 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 in Cannes. Uh, that was during the, the Venice Biennial. And that uh, is very interesting. Uh, Rui, she, she had invested in this um, kind of encounter between uh, this old master of ink painting and Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso might have forgotten um, um, the uh, Kibaishi the day after because uh, it, it was a very asymmetric encounter. While in China, it was really welcomed. It was the kind of finally uh, 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 China was considered equal with the West. I mean, but in the West, this this kind of encounter in the uh, in the public uh, opinion and also in the press hadn't almost any a, a, any any echo. While in China, it was that kind of. Sign, a symbol of a uh, uh, tall period, you know. That, also, that, that, that are the history about uh, uh, um, with which we are dealing in this uh, project. Damian or Ortega, the cosmic thing, that, that's also the first uh, contribution, official contribution of, Mexican, um, of Mexico at the Biennale in Venice. Some of you, I, I don't know who has seen them, it, the, the, the kind of the deconstructed uh, beetle. It has a high um, symbolic value because the beetle type had been produced in Mexico um, until the, uh, the, uh, the 90s, uh, um, exclusively in Mexico, after in Germany uh, uh, Volkswagen just had quitted the production. Uh, that, that's, uh, I don't want to go into detail, just uh, show you what's uh, go, uh, um, going on, ha actually. And um, um, it was not only a concession to the genius Loki of my patron in the, at the Swiss Institute of Art Research to take the Swiss pavilion as a first example of research. Switzerland. Uh, consists it in itself of a European microcosm, a construct of nation harboring a multilingual culture between the German, French, Italian, and Retoromanic idioms. Besides of the participants of uh, East Central Europe, we choose the American pavilion 
First, because uh, USA have risen from a marginal post-colonial position in that period, uh, late, late 19th century, to a dominating discourse power during the second half of the 20th century. There are, secondly, strong political correspondences with Switzerland, as both nations took a look back to a long Republican um, democratic tradition. Now I come to my second point, laboratories of globalization. The Venice biennial type of exhibiting is a relic um, out of 19th century. I, I also will show um, you then the Czechoslovak pavilion just from 19, uh, 2013 where, um, where, where you, um, uh, you uh, Ma um, Marek, uh, you have uh, made your marvelous uh, presentation. Um, but now I will go back to this kind of forerunners of the pavilion type. Con um, this, the concept of pavilions constructed in a national style found in Abergy in the Paris Exposition Universelle of 1889 when Charles Garnier, the um, architect of the Paris Opera, laid out a world history of human housing in model buildings at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. The Venice biennial pavilions follow the idée fixe of arranging architecture according to national characteristics. Whereas the mostly, ephemer, uh, mostly ephemeral buildings were normally torn down after the show or shipped back to the countries of the participants, the Venice art pavilions remained as a foci of a national competition idea from old Europe. The first uh, Biennale di Venezia um, took place in 1895, just one year before the first Olympic Games took place in Athens. Its founder, Pierre de Coubertin, had originally planned to combine the sporting encounter of the world's youth by a peaceful contest with an international art exhibition. In a way, um, the, the, um, the, um, the Venice Biennial and uh, the Olympic Games are sort of twins. Yeah. No, they are just uh, they differentiated then sport and 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 art uh, and, and fine art. The industrial world fairs of the penultimate uh, century represent an early form of uh, supranational power structures with imperial, uh, imperial claims in policy and economy. The leading nations outbidded each other not only by the popular performance of accelerated means of transport and technical um, communication but also by exhibiting to the masses of visitors craving for sensation and exotic human menagerie. I show you just a book of mine uh, who is, who is de which is dealing about um, the Exposition Universelle uh, in um, Paris, 1889. Um, <clears throat> now, the human men menagerie, you see here Kanak da dancers, um, the import of subjects out of the colonies instructed to perform their so-called primitive life within artificial habitats. The world fairs show globalization en miniature whose proceeding creates a paradox. It is exactly the technical progress and the homogenization that caused the claim for cultural identity. Technological internationalism and cultural regionalism are twins. 
homogenization and differentiation as a synchroni synchronous process of globalization can be observed back to the deep 19th century. This assumption relies on Roland, uh, Roland Robertson term of glocality, which intertwines the global and the local. As an inveterate Hegelian me, I use to explain it by the wit of my philosophical master. Identität ist die Identität der Identität mit dem Nicht-Identischen. Identity is the identity with the, um, of identity with the non-identical. The sentence out of the Wissenschaft der Logik, also Science of Logic, may help us to understand the dialectics of globalization. Its process consists in the effect that a consciousness for cultural differences emerges just by industrial homogenization. That way, homogenization corresponds with identification, that leveling of appropriate by appropriation, that use of force by which the non-equal appears. So the non-identical is fabricated by the process of identification. Identity, so one can conclude, is equal to non-identity as it becomes identic with nothing else than with itself by identification. This uh, pictures might show us, uh, sh shows us this process how a black boy is identified by white people as the other one, the one who is non-identical with themselves, those who are lounging there freshly bathed on the bank. Non-identically oscillating remains even the subject of the picture. The catalog of the 1889 World Fair where the Belgian painter uh, Louis-Joseph um, Antonissen had been awarded, names the title L'Intrus, the Intruder. Like this sans papier, also the paperless boat, boat peoples of our days. Politically more correct is the title I found in an actual auction list, Le Petit Ramoneur. The, the little chimney sweep. How harmless. Identification turns into a carnival joke. But just a little digression to illustrate your this kind of dialection uh, of the identity and of identity and non-identity. The process of globalization and the process of identification follows the same dialectics. Let us translate it into political terms and differentiate the two reverse motions, the hegemonic and the cultural identities. The Venice Biennial offers a variety of uh, case studies. Hegemonic identity is the brand of success which marks the prerogatives of the leading nation states Hegemonic is the self-evident claim for imperial power, the dominant influence in the global market, the military and the political superiority. Just translate that in our, our day's imagery. Chef Kuhn's dog, my, and now just in front of France, uh, François Pinault's um, gorgeous, uh, um, gorgeous collections, his own puppy. It might work as an example of ruling hegemonic identity. The spectacular post-pop eye-catcher matching with uh, Venice event tourism. The particular uh, cultural identity, uh, here I show um, Shenzhen at, um, at the Arsenale in, um, at the show of 1999. 
doesn't compete for dominance than for peculiarity in being different. Cultural identity manifests itself in aesthetics, in form of local specificity, of curiosity, of otherness. Patterns of cultural identity stem back to the aesthetic discourses of antiquity, where musicians distinguished the Dorian, the Phrygian, the Lydian, the Mixolydian, and the Locrian modes, harmonies indicating a local provenience. The consciousness of cultural identity implies cultural self-determination. In the first wave of globalization, the right for cultural autonomy remained the privilege of the nation states and colonial powers, which also colonized the Giardini of Venice by building up their pavilions. Art was homonymous with Euro-American art. Products out of the colonies and uh, protectorates were labeled as artisanry, like um, this, uh, uh, we see here um, a photo from the showroom of uh, the Musée de l'Homme uh, at the turn of the century. The prescribed terminology on international affairs between national arts and colonial crafts kept being mandatory until mid-20th century. Nevertheless, I, can, we can, uh, we, I have to jump in our present day. In the long run, the process of globalization, to put it with uh, Hegel, performed a ruse of reason. The world exhibition constituted the la uh, laboratory of a gradual undermining of the borders between self-proclaimed high culture and primitivity. The spectacle was in fact designed as a showcase for the achievement of the leading industrial powers, as you see here. But at the same time, the culture of the European nation states were subject of a gradual creolisation. The westernization of the world simultaneously brings about an orientalization of the West. The history of this process finds its laboratory in the history of the Biennale di Venezia. Now I come um, to a methodic questionnaire, uh, which I will, will hold myself a little bit brief. All, all the, the doctoral and postdoctoral uh, um, students, they join this questionnaire when they go, um, uh, when they initiate their research. One aspect is about center and periphery. Our, um, that means not only the center um, uh, equal Paris or New York, but it means also center and periphery, and that's even more interesting within nation states. There are marginal um, cultural uh, regions in a, in, a, in a nation state as well. And just in uh, in the way how um, the Venice Biennale was exhibited by the nation states showed always these conflicts. Who is, uh, I mean, Bratislava, or who, who, is, who can, can um, make the, the, the show for one presentation of the nation? Is it the Slovak party or is it, is it Prague? Right? That's, that were really um, sensitive and um, uh, conflictful um, um, moments, also in Switzerland, for instance, um, where it was always a quarrel between the German-speaking and the French-speaking and the Italian-speaking uh, um, um, artists. Uh, that, that's um, a very interesting micro, I, I mean, micro history of nations, which, uh, which can be studied by this question. Then a second aspect is about politics, policy, and style, uh, where the question better there is for specific political profiles, we have specific 
um, artistic styles. Then uh, it's about display and exhibition history. I, I, I will take, um, make, I, I don't want to go too deep into that, but art economy and art market, a very important aspect. Um, most of the, um, uh, at the uh, turn of the century, uh, until, uh, uh, until um, the Second World War, the, um, for, um, in, in, Pol in Poland, in, 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 um, in Yugoslavia, in, uh, um, um, and, and in Romania, there was a very marginal art market. In a way, the Venice Biennale, it was the market, the international market. It was the way to, uh, to, to, to sell arts in, uh, on an international platform. As I come back to this uh, aspect, um, the Venice Biennial was an art fair until um, 1968. Then we, we, we'll deal about critique um, on discourse, about the, the, press, uh, um, the press reactions abroad and in the country, and life and afterlife of the artist. Well, I have here um, we, uh, we, um, uh, a, a distinction which is, I think, very productive to uh, uh, distinguish between um, um, prime time and heterochrony. And I will just explain what I mean with, with, with prime time first. The prime time is, is there are the big, the, 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 the big supranational kind of shock waves like Second World War, like fascism, uh, and so on. During the first uh, Biennale exhibitions, the old European Entente powers indulged in their cultural and colonial sovereignty in a style between academism Impressionism and Art Nouveau by ignoring and repelling the avant-garde. During the 1910 exhibition that showed works by um, Gustav Klimt, Renoir, and uh, even a, retros a retrospective of um, uh, Courbet, the Secretary General Fradeletto ordered the removal of a painting by Pablo Picasso from the Spanish pavilion. The turn of the century novelties were appreciated by the Venetian curators with a considerable delay. When, for instance, in 1920, a group of artists between post-impressionism and Die Brücke were exhibited. A show of Negro sculpture in 1922 gave way of turmoil. So, so we, we have this kind of prime time uh, data, and on the uh, other side, if we go to the what we call heterochrony, that is the specific local time, um, uh, just a, 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 an example out of periphery and center, where we got aware that in the 20s and 30s, there was a huge craze of folk art, um, not, uh, and this folk, um, which was very, uh, so, uh, which also sold very well. There was an international, the international public in Venice, they sold, uh, they, they, they purchased these kind of pictures. They didn't know um, the artist, but they, they sold it because it was inexpensive. The most inexpensive were the, the ones from Romania, but they were they was just cute. They this kind of peasant um, um, uh, genre, uh, that, that was something which was very, um, uh, was a hype in the, between, the, uh, between the wars. Most highly interesting, even in the United States, we find uh, um, 1932 uh, uh, an exhibition of Indian handicraft. 
and also Pologne, the Polonian uh, pavilion showed quasi handcraft of peasants in, um, at the Biennale of Venice. That, that was that's something which um, surprised us, that, that this kind of heterochronical aspects simultaneously appear, Sim simultaneously appear. Um, Russia entered the stage of the Biennale in 1914, still under the patronship of the Tsar. But after First World War, the Bolsheviks hissed the red flag with hammer and sickle above the na national pavilion. I, I just scroll a little bit to, to, uh, through the history. We, we are kind of in the second shock wave um, quasi the, the emergence of, um, of totalitarian states. Um, Adolf Hitler um, visited the Biennale in 1934, and he was especially not amused about um, the German um, presentation, because the turn of the century pavilion he found completely de demodé, and then he initiated th this pavilion, which still have uh, um, um, which is still uh, quasi used from 1938. Just um, uh, another photograph um, on um, the right, you see the British uh, pavilion, where you can see a symbolic war policy in the Giardini. It was the, um, the, the last, the, the, the the last um, um, exhibition in 1942, 1944, then it, it was in, in, in the last heat of the war, um, it was closed. But um, you see here, one year after the Battle of Britain, with disastrous losses uh, for the German Air Force, the Italian allies um, had seized at least the English pavilion, as I say, uh, po uh, symbolically overrun it. And you see it, there are um, two, sol to two Italian soldiers kind of, kind of um, holding it occupied. I mean, uh, such scenery reminds us a little bit on, on what's going on in um, um, the Ukraine. Switzerland, I have to um, blame uh, the, um, the own country, demonstrated its neutrality in all, by participating at the last war biennale, um, where almost only Axis powers had uh, exhibited. So, Biennale owes, cynically spoken, a first shy opening towards contemporary thanks to the mistress of and first biographer of the Duce, Margarita Sarfatti, the so-called vanguard of the muse of fascism. By her influence, the Venice Biennial um, gained since um, 1926 the function of an artistic figurehead of the regime. By a royal decree, the control of the Biennale was uh, passed over from the city of Venice to the Italian state, whose conductor in the meantime had ditched the semi-official uh, semi education minister, Sarfati. This change was in tune with the building up of an iron axis between fascist Italy and Hitler Germany. The Jewish origin of uh, Sarfati didn't match um, anymore the race ideology of both countries. Instead of fine arts, the mass media of cinema gained the favors of cultural policy. The first Esposizione Internazionale d'Arte Cinematografica took place in 1932. Well, that's the third, the third kind of shock wave of prime time was then 
uh, after the war, Cold War ideological competition and peaceful coexistence, uh, which can a, a long time um, range from 47 to 89. By a six years break, the first Biennale after, uh, after World War II took place in 1948. The, the post-war art system went through an era of re rehabilitating the great masters of the European avant-garde in retrospect. In 1952, Switzerland opened a freestanding functionalist exhibition pavilion by Bruno Giacometti, the brother of um, Alberto, in the spirit of Bauhaus. The shadow of Yalta, just to, to quote uh, Piotr Piotrovsky, separated the art field in the eastern and the western hemisphere in the realms of abstraction and of socialist realism. I show you just um, uh, in this kind of split camera, um, we have this kind of abstract modernism um, in the Western type. On the other way, the, the Romanian pavilion with um, socialist realism. And it is um, a nice um, anecdote of um, criticism that this um, pavilion had been awarded by the PC Italiana, by the Partito Comunista Italiana, had <laughs> gave, given to Romania a, a prize. So you can see that this kind of um, iron curtain was sometimes also sort of uh, transparent. I'm, I'm, I, I see that, that I have so much um, uh, pictures to, to, to show you and I, I have seen on my um, watch, I should probably go a little bit, make a little bit, um, um, uh, accelerate my speed and um, to um, explain you just this kind of, uh, one aspect we, we dealt with was um, the, the, this aspect of politics, policies and style. Um, uh, the, the, the issue of realism, how was it dealt with? And th th then we found an interesting, um, also anecdotic um, reception history that at the 1954 Biennale in, in, um, in, uh, of uh, the, the United States, they showed their Jackson Pollocks, but in the drawer they had um, um, lithographs from Ben Shan just showing, oh, we are also able for, for, for critical social realism, but we are actually now uh, performing the abstract, um, the, the language of uh, um, abstract expressionism. Well, um, then the, the big shock was then 19, the shock for, for the French nation was then uh, the prize of Robert Ra Rauschenberg, who won the, uh, the Grand Premio uh, um, 1964. Uh, after, uh, uh, while before, every all the time only a French uh, um, a French artist had won this prize, and that was the beginning of a new paradigm. And um, when. Um, when uh, the United States became the leading power of art discourse in the second part of 20th century. But nevertheless, I think one overrates a little bit the influence of pop art in the 60s. And, and if one really looks a little bit how it spreads out, um, pop art in the 60s was more or less only in Germany. Germany was the most diligent kind of uh, pupil of um, post-war um, Pax Americana, while uh, na neither in France nor in Italy, uh, in the Western, uh, in, in uh, any Western uh, country, also in Switzerland, there was no pop art. I, I mean, there was rather this kind of neo-surrealism or Dadaism in the, in the 50s and 60s. 
that um, all, all this that that are aspects we are kind of in our uh, simultaneous kaleidoscopic way of uh, research we are um, uh, investing in i i think i will shorten this uh, this part and come um, now to our time the co global contemporary or which i prefer to say um, the global peripheries the western art system got rivaled by artists as when uh, the scroll of the the wall was quite was completed by artists from beyond the euro-american era a peacemaking director of a global opening was Harald Seemann, who created by Dapper Tutto in 1999 and Plateau of Humankind in 2001, two Venice uh, biennials. Seemann crossed the historical turning point from transatlantic postmodernism to global art. At this um, 1999 show, he surprised the public with a large choice of Korean and Chinese artists, hitherto scarcely represented neither in exhibitions and certainly not in Western galleries. One of his favorite paintings, as he told me, was Wang Xingwei's poor, poor Old Hamilton, certainly because uh, it deals with uh, the work of one of his great heroes, Marcel, Marcel Duchamp. Dressed up in a uniform uh, shirt out of Mao cultural revolution, a little boy has dared to damage Duchamp's large glass and gets told off now by a female museum educator in a trouser suit, uh, typical for the emancipated westernized businesswoman. At the wall hangs another programmatic icon by Duchamp, the ready-made L-H-O-O-Q, L-H-O-O-Q. She has a hot bottom, a print of Leonardo's La Gioconda distorted by a mustache. In the background, we recognize Richard Hamilton the doyen of English pop art playing a museum guardian unable to prevent the iconoclastic act of the young, young Maoist boy. The pictures bring up a crucial question about the relation between universals in art and the location, uh, the local conditions of art making. In what extent the Western canon of mod modernism is authoritative in the age of global art. Is the Duchamp effect indeed a prerogative to be observed by every contemporary artist in the world? Do the rules of pop strategies belong to the universals in today's art system? There are questions with the Seaman legacy has raised but not answered yet. It is the basic theoretical and practical problem of the art system since it entered the global extension. Against a fuzzy comprehension of world art, I assume the art system to be a historical unique cultural achievement based on the ideas of European Enlightenment and the process of decolonization. I call them the four virtues of the art system. The humanist concept first of the self-determined individual. Second, the civic estimation of work. That's uh, probably uh, um, to, just to explain it. Antiquity in a way hadn't um, uh, Pausanias brought up the problem when he said, we love art, but we are despising its producer. And, and we, we see in, in other high cultures where, um, where 
artifacts are highly, um, uh, highly estimated, but the individuals who have created them they are, are unknown. They have no identity. They are not kind of, uh, they, they have not been individualized by reception. Third, the economical practicing of open markets, and fourth, the freedom of uh, public uh, opinion. If only one of this is lacking or is sort of ailing, then art is um, impossible. These achievements have developed over centuries from the philosophy of humanism via civic social ethics to a policy of institutionalized democracy and the liberation movements of the colonies. To borrow a term from Michel Foucault, these four virtues constitute the historical, the, the historical a priori of art. I think I will just, um, in order uh, that we can enter a discussion, I will jump a little bit I have also, I would have had a, a digression on the, um, on the uh, Cartesian curator, which I will omit now, and also the fact that um, there was, since 1999, uh, the, the white cube had been installed uh, in, um, in, at the Biennale, and the problem is, is that a good idea, or sh should we really um, more pay homage to this outdated um, pavilion system? For probably one, one case I would have liked to, to, um, to bring up just about an anecdote about center and periphery. Also it, it has been, um, uh, as you all know, um, Harry Zeman introduced uh, this, uh, the white cube into the uh, Biennale di Venezia. Afterwards, there were kind of, uh, at the first architecture Biennale, they already used uh, the Corderie, but um, uh, the, the Fine Arts um, Biennale started then, take the, uh, took it up in 1999. But one, at least one, one um, original sin um, has been committed by, um, by uh, Harry Seyman. Just um, probably the most problematic case was the clash Seyman had with Andre Cadere. The young Romanian artist um, was supposed to be invited to participate at the Documenta 5. Thinking about a Romanian art, Seman had Constantin Brancouge in mind, who had arrived in Paris uh, 1904 by foot, having walked most of the way from Munich a year after having left Bucharest. Seaman found it to be a good idea to illustrate the distance between center and periphery, taking Castle for Paris and asking Cadere to participate at the Documenta by wandering like his ancestors by foot, carrying one of his uh, stripped rods as walking stick. Cadere accepted first the invitation, but didn't take Seyman's order too literal. Kadire took it playfully. He sent postcards to the Documenta office from places in France and Germany along the imaginary hiking way to northern Hessen metropolis. But when Seyman got to know that Kadere had arrived in, in fact from Paris by train, he excluded him from participation. In vain, Cadere protested against this kind of mystified periphery. He didn't want to play exotic otherness. 
worshipping for, from poor rural Romania to the epicenter of international contemporary art. I come uh, to my conclusion. The impulse of globalization after the Second World War was supported by decolonization, but at the same time slowed down by the block construction installed by Yalta Conference, which divided the globe into two, rather in three, zones of in influence. Western art survived under the protection of the Iron Curtain, the well-arranged world of, meanwhile, former West was international in the old-fashioned way. A less differentiated system shows less variety. Within former West, the artist's provenience had few importance. Artistic positions didn't mark cultural localization, but strategies of production, abstraction, new realism, um, uh, informel concept art, worked as stylistic universals which neglected political and geographic borders. So there is a direct relation between um, uh, global art and the end of stylistic universals. Postmodernism, by the way, was the end of the line um, as aesthetical discourse of uh, its belt, like Humphrey Bogart in um, uh, Casablanca played against them, um, the, the old canon of Western modern tradition. By the dissolution of the political bloc system, a completely different art geography emerged. Only now the post-colonial order was aesthetically activated. Under global conditions, the local becomes the leading mo motive. That's the dialectics of globalization. It localizes cultural identity and globalizes the aesthetic principle of distinction. By the dissolution of Western art, the habitual distinction between center and periphery becomes obsolete. The hierarchy of the poles is inverted. The peripheral as an aesthetic phenomenon constitutes the discourse. The local idealect of an artistic position the fact of a specific ethnical provenience is the message. But attention, provinciality itself doesn't pay out yet. The artist has to act peripheral on the platform of a center. Peripheral aesthetics needs the center as contrast agent. Only here, she or he finds an efficient public and institutional attention. Th there might be powerful emerging economics in China, India, and Brazil. Nevertheless, despite of all the ethno-folkloristic touch they provide, the good old West is still managing the economy of attention and the market. The emerging countries, instead, are involved with contradictions in cultural policy. The hegemonic Western capitalism adorns itself, instead, tolerantly with a manifold of cultural identities. This sort of Machiavellism lacks the political powers like China, or Russia, just uh, see the Conchita Wurst uh, um, craze, you know, that what, what it, it just creates a, a clash of civilization. Uh, or we are uh, looking, uh, we will discuss probably what happens with the manifesta now, um, and will Kaspar König have a problem now in, when, when this kind of under this um, 
um, uh, circumstances of uh, political uh, crisis. China and, um, uh, countries like China or Russia export their artists by political backslashes. That's the way why the old Western centers are still flourishing. Staging periphery in the diaspora. They don't dictate their own styles anymore, like the good old Ecole de Paris. Amsterdam, New York, London, Barcelona, and Berlin offer a multicultural network of metropolitan urbanity. Um, Hung Tung Lu um, in Taiwan, um, uh, I show you just as an illustration, this nice pictures, um, also one of the favorite of, of Hari, Hari Seyman, uh, who, who showed this uh, picture in the 1999 Biennale. We see a globalized hybrid manga figure in front of an incoronation of Mary in a Venetian thread Trecento style alla Byzantina. The artist's homage to the hosting former Serenissima. As a, so we have this kind of diasporic uh, touch, you know, this kind of hybridity needs the contrast, uh, the, a contrast agent as a means. Um, the iconography refers to the history of the um, of Hung Tunglu's native country, stemming from Taiwan. Former Formosa Island, baptized by Portuguese seafarers, colonized by and Christianized by the Dutch East India Company, driven away by Han Chinese settlers, and so forth. The manga figure reminds to Japan the more the most recent and most um, violent colonialist who seized the island in 1894. So in these pictures, Hung Tung Lu tells the history of a hybrid cultural identity. Um, Venice is, for this statement, the temporary center of the global art field. The Biennale acts as a wheel of peripheries in the diaspora. The aesthetics of contemporary art is migratory. Its semantics evokes a specific provenience. In the light of this fact, the critic of the national pavilions attests of a naive universalism which stems back to the good old time of the former West. The recurrent suggestion to ignore, to demolish or to overwrite them ignores the effect of globalization, it, which localizes the peri periphery. Up to a couple of weeks ago, the average Western European held the borders of the na nation states for granted in an extent that any questions about nationality status were considered to be outdated, even reactionary, and therefore needless. That's the mentality of people who know World War II only out of school books that mirror the social liberal consensus of affluent Western society. Ukraine, the actual travel spot, unsettled this far too comfortable certainty. Cosmopolitanism and metropolitan urbanity can only succeed if local political forces are balanced out. Therefore, it might be a good, a good moment for artists curator and critics to take care about the outdated national pavilions of Venice, like Marit Pocconi did, you know, one year ago. Thank you for your attention, and it was really di difficult to, 
to speak because of this 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 um, one one loses the sort of uh, the uh, the concentration by this by this um, murmur yeah but now I hope we we can enter a um, a discussion thank you very much I'm I'm so sorry for this uh, for this uh, atmosphere. I would uh, very much wish to uh, simply move it somewhere. So I think we showed it somehow mm. now for for a short this discussion. Uh, maybe you can sit a little closer to us, so it wouldn't be so so disturbing from from downstairs. I'm I'm sure about this. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions from from the from the audience right now? Uh, I will try to uh, actualize. Uh, maybe this is uh, since Marek Pokorny was creator of uh, two times of Czechoslovak mm -hmm. pavilion, so the photograph shows the previous one, and the title is from mm -hmm. from the last years, uh, but. Uh, at, at the end of, of, of the lecture, you you actualize it with a reference to actual manifesta mm -hmm. this year, and uh, through this, uh, and sometimes it appeared the uh, um, references to cont to situation about Ukraine. I, I I want to postpone it for the next year. Right now, the, there is a Soviet or Russian pavilion in uh, mm -hmm. in Venice in in Giardini. So, what do you think? How? What do you think will be in in Russian pavilion, and how we can take it actually? How we can read it next year in context? What you said about this uh, uh, Cold War uh, kind of uh, showing of the best what what uh, the scenes had in their own art and, and so on. That, and the Russian pavilion is one of the best um, research pavilion ever because it, it just came out a, a huge uh, and, and awarded. Uh, it, it was, a, a, by the way, a, a students I know who also participated in our circle of discussion. Um, um, Bartolome, uh, um, um, that, that, um, that was, uh, did you see it one, uh, once at the, the Russian pavilion? Because uh, it had been spon sponsored by oligarchs, you know, uh, who are really proud about uh, this pavilion, um, which also serves them as kind of um, validating and, and pushing uh, Russian art, you know, to show to show an artist at the Biennale Venice Biennial that makes rise uh, that it's like like a manipulation of uh, of the stock ex exchange, you know, you, you, you put it, the action, you know, you make a kind of uh, operation and then uh, it rises, the prices rises, you know. Uh, that's also one aspect, uh, a, a cynical aspect why pavilions are still so considered to be important. Because you can influence discourse by, on a national level. But did you intend this? <laughs> when? Maybe it's more simple for me to speak uh, uh, Czech uh, because of uh, a lot of complicated ideas I got, so I can mm -hmm. uh, explain it in, in, uh, in my native language. So, I bych měl možná dvě poznámky k tomu, co jsme slyšeli během těch posledních několika deseti minut. Za prvé, já bych velmi rozlišoval mezi tím, co se stalo v 19. století, mezi tím, co se dělo před druhou světovou válkou a mezi tím, čemu můžeme říkat dneska globalizace. Já bych pořád ještě viděl jako důležitější aspekt koloniálního diskurzu v 19. století a o globalizaci jako takové bych asi mluvil až někdy po v souvislosti s dekolonializací a s obdobím po roce 1960. A to z jednoho prostého důvodu, že to mocenské centrum bylo 
řekněme, koncentrováno v západním světě a po roce 1960 se i kapitál začíná chovat podstatně jinak a ovlivňuje, ovlivňuje distribuci zájmu a distribuci moci a to souvisí samozřejmě s tím, čemu my dneska říkáme globalizace. Takže to je první taková metodická poznámka a s tím souvisí samozřejmě i to, jak vypadalo bienále, jak vypadaly instituce, které souvisely s uměním na západě, protože pořád se bavíme o tom západě, ty venátky přece jenom jsou součástí západu a vliv globalizace na podobu venátského bienále je možná intenzivněji patrný v posledních 20 letech. Takže to je jedna, jedna poznámka. Druhá poznámka, mě tam zaujaly vlastně ty metodické řady těch 10 bodů. Pro mě by bylo třeba hodně zajímavé, jakým způsobem se ty metodické body používaly při výzkumu, to znamená, jestli se aplikovaly jako, nebo které z nich se aplikovaly jako linky eh, historicky průběžné, eh, to znamená asynchronně, a které vlastně daleko více intenzivnější se dají používat ve smyslu nějaké synchrony nebo nějakého horizontálního eh, výzkumu eh, v rámci toho, co se dělo eh, v rámci Benátského bienále. A třetí poznámka, úplně poslední a možná pro diskuzi je ta, že pro mě jako pro člověka, který samozřejmě nějakým způsobem zná dějiny Benátského Benátsk, mm. bienále, zná dějiny umění, tak Benátské bienále vždycky bylo spíš úlohou kurátorskou a to, co pro mě bylo vždycky důležitější, bylo, jakým způsobem v konkrétní situaci se kurátor jako reprezentant určitého státu, protože v našem prostředí je placen státem za to, že dělá Benátské bienále, má k celému tomu kontextu a komplexu otázek chovat. Mm. Oh, uh, there are th three questions which, which are um, quite uh, we, we could discuss <laughs> at length. First, uh, uh, may I repeat? It's about um, the term of globalization. Then it's about, um, about uh, that it is kind of um, 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 synchronical or um, kind of diachronical aspect. Yes. Uh, let, let's uh, speak about first about globalization. I know that there is, in fact, uh, there are two schools. One school would, would, would say that globalization is only takes place by decolonization. But just uh, there is another school which identifies globalization as an act, uh, um, a long durée which started already with um, uh, the discovery um, the discovery of, of America. That, that, that this, and, and one aspect which is more highly important and um, the link between um, globalization and consumerism. And, and that, that's just this, this, this very important th theorists of uh, the, the school, this Chicago school of uh, uh, Robertson I, I just mentioned. The, the, who, who coined the term locality, they, they link glo uh, globalization with consumerist um, um, consumation um, um, habits. And, and there you can see that in the 19th century, art fairs are kind of laboratories of consumation where uh, just for this, um, where in a, in a way kind of utopic, utopian, um, um, an utopian um, advance of habits which we, we just gained then after, um, yeah, after Second World War, this by, by America, uh, Americanization. But this kind of, of utopy of, of, of consumism that, that was already, uh, that, that made um, art fairs in 19th century so popular. Because um, I, I think one, one cannot neglect that, that um, con, um, uh, because also economically, uh, consu um, the kind of the international, the global extension of, co um, 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 uh, of, of products of consumption. Coca-Cola, or all this, this, uh, this, 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 
the trading with, 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 with junk food and all this kind of stuff. That, that's the way which is kind of um, feeding uh, literally the process of uh, uh, globalization and making it economically attractive and, uh, and popular. And uh, that's the way uh, there is uh, one school who, who just uh, makes an emphasis of the uh, consu uh, consumation aspect, mass products. When ma ma mass product emerged and, and uh, more and more people were then just dependent of mass products. And that starts in the 19th century, also with, with electrific, um, electrification, for instance. That's uh, just one. But uh, just to uh, conclude, there are kind of, there is uh, a kind of um, two schools. And uh, you, you represent the other one? No, no, no. It's a, for, for, it's, for me, it's more important uh, the, uh, the, the quality break uh, in what we mean under the terms of uh, globalization. And yeah. this, is, this is more important in the second half of the 20th century mm. than uh, it, it not takes the uh, globalization of the, of the uh, image of the world or mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, consumerism in the 19th century. There is mm -hmm. a two absolutely different uh, uh, processes, I think. Mm -hmm. It is um, connected, but the quality of the process of, of the 19th century and the second half of the 20th mm -hmm. century is absolutely different from my point of view. Yeah, there, there, are, there are two forces, there are two uh, vectors. The one is Kind of yeah, okay, the, the okay, I, I, I can stop the, the, this discussion because I understand yeah. it well. It, it was only the methodical uh, notice yeah. to your explanation of uh, what uh, globalization is. And the other, uh, your second question about about um, the, the kind of uh, methodical um, uh, questions, they are meant to be uh, synchronical on one hand, but also diachronical. You can. Uh, you can just invest them. Um, this uh, the research on um, markets, well, the national markets. It is um, a diachronical development on one hand, and, um, or, the, or also politics and style. But the, they are synchronically applied to different countries, and and that uh, one problem with with art history is. Uh, still, that one always has a focus on one, on one uh, nation state or one kind of geographic, uh, limited geographic um, uh, entity. And uh, what we tried is uh, just, and that would be synchronical, this diachronic, diachronical um, uh, questions is um, synchronically applied to different uh, uh, local specificities. And the third uh, question was uh, about, uh, was about uh, curatorial. The third question was about uh, uh, curatorial, curatorial uh, rethinking of the situation of the Venice Biennial for the project for Czechoslovak Pavilion or Swiss, Swiss Pavilion and so on. This, this is for, for, my, for me the most important uh, issue of the discussion. Yeah, I, I think uh, that has indeed become, um, uh, the uh, curator has, has become kind of an, um, that uh, uh, curating has become applied, applied architecture because you are dealing with spaces. And that, I think that's a development which probably just started uh, 10, 15 years ago. I think with, with uh, um, and there, um, Harald Seemann was really a pioneer. When he started, he, he was uh, one of the first, um, um, Marcel Brod, he, 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 his master was Marcel Brothars. He, he learned everything from uh, uh, Marcel Brothars. Nobody uh, says it, but, but it, it's true. And, and Harald Seemann was aware that he, he was really um, 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 credited a lot of, of, of Marcel Brothaus. But, but, but uh, actually, as a curator, he, he was one of the first who um, entered um, 
post-industrial sites. And so where you have to deal yes, with, with, uh, with, with this kind of architecture, what do, are you doing? And even now with the pavilion, as you did, I, I, you dealt with this um, architecture of the pavilion. And I think that's, that's actually a really, um, I think, on the peak of, of discussion. Um, we, um, in, uh, this, um, now, uh, um, in, in June starts the architecture um, biennale, and they are completely, uh, they, they are uh, quasi busy with, with this architecture. They are analyzing the, the architecture of the uh, pavilions. Also you, you are, in a way, uh, a kind of a pioneer in this, in this, um, in this doing. Uh, sorry, I have one question because, as Marek said, for me also the curatorial approach is very important. But there is one more thing which is, I think, very important in here. I don't know if in other countries. And I am wondering if you have been dealing in your research with this question, and that is how the peak is going on. Because it's a there are national pavilions, there is an art, who is the one who is picking it? Mm -hmm. Was it also part of your research or, or this was something you didn't deal with because you dealt with the architecture, with globalization, etc. But it's really important how the pick of what is going to be in the pavilion, uh, how the, pi I, uh, the pick of the artist, the pick of what kind of art, the, the choice. Mm -hmm. Who is making the choice? If this was part of your research, yes, that that that, that is one of the most um, very important. Just if you um, go through the history, uh, who is can who are the agents of of this the decision um, the, of decision, and that, that that's really very different. I mean, the most. Um, the most uh, mafia-like uh, uh, method is is, um, is, um, is USA, where from the beginning it it were the big collectors and it were um, the museums. It was the Whitney, it was um, MoMA. They they were in the um, in the curate uh, the kind of behind the curating, and they were kind of pushing trends. That that was really. Uh, from th that, that's probably one extreme model where museums and collectors are the principal agents. And then you have, um, 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 like, like Switzerland is the other extreme, um, though I just told they, they are f similar in, in their Republican tradition, but um, in, in Switzerland it is really the state. It is, it is um, kind of the Ministry of External Affairs who, who take care of that. I mean, that's so different. Uh, and, and in other countries, there are just some gal galleries, uh, kind of lobbyists. Um, it is always kind of an oscillating or kind of either there are really political there are kind of political considerations. In, 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 in Switzerland, for instance, they say, oh, last time there were, we had an Italian uh, uh, quasi from the Ticino, and now we have uh, finally to find some one from the Romandie. And then that, that's just a political <laughs> poli a, a vice and a kind of fatherly kind of um, Justice, uh, do justice to, to the to the crowd of of, of 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 the artists, and in other countries there are really market oriented um, market oriented criteria. I don't, uh, how is it in in, in Slovakia? <laughs> it's a really complicated situation in it, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe one one uh, uh, notice to uh, your speech for me is. Uh, this is the reason uh, why is the Venice Biennial for me so interesting at all. After 25 years, I went mm -hmm. to, to the Venice Biennial because uh, 
uh, every biennial is a little bit different because there is a mixture between different approaches and different mm -hmm. dif decisions, different politics and uh, different I don't know what. Mm -hmm. And the reading of uh, the reasons why the project in US Pavilion is this and uh, mm -hmm. how, it, uh, how, it, uh, how is the situation in Romania, uh, what's the situation in Great Britain and, mm -hmm. and, and the mixture between, between these two absolutely different mm -hmm. uh, starting points mm -hmm. in a political sense. Yep. It's very important for me and very interesting because I, uh, I can imagine what's happened in Documenta, in Manifesta, in, in everywhere because there is a curator, there is uh, some sponsors, there is uh, some background for ev everything. But the Venice Biennial is so complicated mm -hmm. uh, 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 for viewer yeah. mm -hmm. because nobody understand well what's happened uh, inside the national pavilions mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's a really uh, secret situation mm -hmm. for everybody it's like a conclave uh, a little, uh, bit, uh, little uh, bit little bit little bit and uh, mm -hmm. you 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 have <laughs> to uh, interpret mm -hmm. a lot of things and uh, a lot of uh, reasons and decisions mm -hmm. And this is, this is very, very exciting for me. And, and when we are speaking about uh, the agents of mm -hmm. uh, pavilions in, in Venice mm -hmm. Biennale, uh, uh, I can interpret it uh, that Venice Biennale is not a democratic uh, space, mm -hmm. nor inside uh, uh, national pavilions. In every case, it's uh, politics. Yeah, that's absolutely, I, I agree, um, absolutely, Be because um, yeah, you have always to deal with, uh, with um, the, 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 uh, the lobby of the market. I, I mean, even, even also in, in the Swiss pavilion, um, even if there is always this kind of political uh, uh, Republican uh, doing justice, you know, and, and not to... Uh, to um, to, to uh, gratify someone who doesn't deserve it. Um, and uh, that, that's in a, in a way, uh, in Switzerland is probably that, uh, that case where one really tries to be, to be just. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, it is kind of an alchemy, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this decision. It is sort of alchemical. Mm -hmm. I thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the popular culture is always much louder than art history and philosophy, and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's right now. And I think we are just a, a mm -hmm. number of people that we can move to to the mm -hmm. place we reserved, and mm -hmm. maybe we can continue with discussion mm -hmm. in yeah. private <laughs> eventually. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay.